Thanks, everyone, uh, for coming uh, on this really wonderful, uh, suddenly hot uh, spring afternoon. Uh, my name is Joshua Escobar, and I'm here to help with the programming for tonight. I teach in the English department here, and um, again, thank you for coming. Uh, we have a stellar lineup for you today. Before we start, though, I'd like to name a few and thank a few collaborators who made this possible. Uh, the C Committee, the Multiliteracy English Transfer uh, Program, the Creative Writing Program, John Connolly in the Atkinson Gallery, the Santa Barbara Museum of Art, Patsy Hicks and Christy Thomas at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. Uh, the duplication staff helped with our posters that we made, Cheryl and Financial Services, Kim Monda and Dean Elizabeth Imhoff for their wonderful support of all this programming. The security, the IT, we have Luke here helping with the recording. Um, the theater department, Jason, Pam, Brittany, um, maintenance staff and operating, and then Jose and Mia for being our wonderful ushers of the afternoon. Um, so, and the foundation at, here at SBCC who has also always been a tremendous supporter of the arts. Um, uh, today, I have the wonderful pleasure of introducing a number of poets here at Santa Barbara City College, including an alumni and then our amazing uh, beloved drag queen, um, and then our special guest. Um, this is our first ever National Poetry Month greeting. Um, so. And uh, and we got a we got a pretty cool turnout. So the only thing I ask of you is that if you enjoy something or you enjoy a poet, that you clap, you shout, you you express yourself. Um, and uh, you know this is a little bit in the afternoon. I haven't had three cups of coffee today, so I'm a little bit like you know all over the place. But um, let's um, show our love, let's show our appreciation for these poets. Um, all right, so we have our first reader of uh, the afternoon, which is uh, me. I'm actually uh, going to <laughs> read a poem. I didn't write my name down on the set list when I should have. Uh, but uh, one of the... Um, one of the poets reading today was like, Professor, you got to read a poem if you're to show us how it's done. And I was like, oh, crap. Oh, oh. That's why I, you know, that's why I brought Carmen here. She knows, <laughs> she knows how it's done. So, But I wanted to read a poem to honor our outgoing poet laureate, um, Emma Treyas, who's here today. So this comes from, uh, she's done a lot of amazing work. Uh, and uh, she's a really amazing collaborator here at our school. Um, and so this comes from her collection, Tropicalia, and this poem's called Love. I keep asking if he'll try and find me after we leave this world, in, in the next place, whatever shining white nothing that entails. I ask him m most after I ask him most after watching post-apocalyptic movies where the palette is nothing but metals and dirt and the weak are caged, the hero without hope but with courage. And no one laughs, especially not the children, left to endure because that is what children do. Will you try and meet me even if our shapes are smudged and beyond recognition? He tells me he doesn't know, he doesn't know what is next, pretending not to see the virgin statues we've collected, crosses, candles lit for scent and gratitude, but mostly to ward off what could come along and cut us apart. I say nothing else. I don't know how to explain what I really mean, although do not leave me as close and what would the next long jaunt be without the smell of him tracing the sheets without his hands. I kind of still got it. All right. So our next reader will be Miriam, and after that, Stacy will read. Um, so everyone, welcome to the stage, uh, Miriam. Thank 
Thank you. I'm super grateful to be here and open up the Poetry Month. Uh, I just I wanted to first give a trigger warning in this poem. I do talk about sexual violence, and so if you do feel uncomfortable um, hearing about this stuff or you're still working through some um, issues yourself, um, please just take a moment and step outside. The trans body. When I talk about the trans body, I learned we were designed to become innately sexual. I once had a man tell me he can't fathom that I'm standing in front of him. To be frank, me either. The institutional gaslighting of gender made me believe I was a unicorn. One night, a man touched my developing breast. He told me, I'm not gay, but I like fake women like you. I wonder why he felt entitled to imprint his lovelessness on me, to pound it into my heart, to see me as just body parts. To be frank, I do too. To them, I am an exploration of their sexuality. To them, I was out of their scope of reality. They expect me to sit within the standards of their kinks, wrap plastic breasts around my neck, be flesh that felt real as fiction. You know what I have to say to that? Honey, suck my pussy. Kiss your dreams goodbye. Put your lips between my thighs because you ain't getting any of these goodies. I remind myself of the sh shoulders I am standing on, my transcestors, the women who bent the universe for me, the people who were not interested in social legitimacy, the ones who lived in the pre present and not promise. If facts don't care about your feelings, here's a fact. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. It can only be transformed. Ahora mirame. Look at me. My girls live within me. They remind me of the love and diamonds at the meeting of my thighs. I am the love letter my people have been waiting for, a living poem. When you let language evolve as it was inherently meant to do, you get a whole different story. The trans body is no longer objectifying. The predestined penis is no longer the conversation starter. Trans people become the bio-spiritual shift of society, healers. When I was writing this poem, I did not want to talk about the trans body. I desperately wanted to write about different aspects of the person I've become. The reality of the situation is that society and this institution has naturalized the disappearance of mis hermanos, mis hermanas, mis hermanes. I have a need to recognize that I am a trans woman in this space right now. I'm a trans woman delivering a speech because some people still can't comprehend or accept my existence. Most societies have been built off the construction of mind. That is a well-accepted idea. Architecture, art, technology was the construction of an individual's inter internal perception of mind. When trans women embrace womanhood and embody it in one of its most eloquent form, we become the creatures against the order of nature. I may not bleed once a month, but on a monthly, weekly, and daily basis, I think of the person I was supposed to be, a psychological cycle of dysphoria. I'm a trans Latina first generation American student. I articulate my body, voice, hairstyle, and gestures like any feminine wo woman would. I want to remind everyone, but most importantly myself, that I want to learn how to be a better human just as much as you do. I want to feel beautiful in my own skin like any person does. 
I want to be seen more than just body parts. I want to own and entitle myself to spaces like these. I want to inspire others to live their truths. Thank you for your time. This is truly a privilege. Thank you so much, uh, Miriam. Uh, next, we have uh, coming to the stage Stacy, and after Stacy will be Aaron. Hi, uh, I'm going to read a poem I wrote that I call Longing. If I can get it up on my phone. It is a tragedy of humanness that we so easily fit into containers that are too small to hold us. As a child, I could hear the roar of the distant ocean from my balcony. Now I live closer to the ocean, but can only hear waves of cars on the freeway. Compared to things that can bring us closer, there are many more things that can separate us. Freeways, landlocked states, work schedules, the dirty dishes you left in the sink, and your fondness for foods that crunch and crumble apart, and arguments as well. I wonder if I long to be the crumbs that spill or the ones you swallow, the confusion of intimacy being as it is. I could try to live in a box with you, but not a house without you. I could try to say that my body is a mountain range with valleys and saddles for you to explore, but no one has yet longed to scale me to feel like they conquered something, like they stand above everyone else looking down at them. The view from my body does not make anyone disappear into the distance. As a child, I read a book about a boy who went and lived in the Catskills in a large tree. Not the branches, but the trunk of the tree. Would I fit inside a tree if I am a mountain? The only problem the boy had was that in the winter, the temperature would drop too low and then the trees might explode. I might explode. I might shatter. I might become an avalanche. I might pour like lava through the room and take the crumbs with me. I'm certain your shoes hurt because you are too large for them. I'm certain that you hurt because you are too large for this room. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Stacy. And you'll find that poem published alongside Carmen's and a number of readers today in our creative writing magazine. So coming to the stage is Aaron. Uh, good afternoon. The piece that I'll be reading today is titled Anitis. <clears throat> I know what it's like to feel like you have to prove something to yourself to show that you're better. But I realized my strength the day that I understood that I was only human. The voices inside stopped. I stopped being weak. I stopped being a failure. It wasn't just that I had become more like them, but that they had become just like me, just as desperate, just as doubtful and alone, as pathetic. Trust me, you aren't as tragically broken as you'd like to believe. Don't 
be so full of yourself. You're only a scattered mess of jigsaw pieces. And I know it hurts. And I know how good it feels to be enraged. But you won't accomplish anything for yourself this way. Now, let me show you what I have learned. Let me help put your puzzle together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aaron. And he memorized that, so that's uh, pretty brilliant. Um, Ale is going to come to the stage, and then we'll have Caleb. So please welcome Ale. Hi, my name is Ale, and I'm going to be performing a piece called I See You. I see you. That's something you ought to know. Even when you don't know, which you probably do sometimes. There's no need to brush it off and feeling unsure that it's actually me, thinking it's a mirage. I see you as tough and tenacious as you can be. I see how it bothered you when you, he called you goth wearing your favorite skirt. I know you. No, I know you know. It's not particularly what he said, but the timing and place, the delivery of his trajectory. But here's the thing, tiny human. It was just a point of view, a different focal point, highly contrasted in the capture of your rapture. Let this be brushed aside without any chromatic substance. Remember, x plus y equals z, not equaling to x. The X is a reminder of how you will know your nucleus is in growth. Why is the before conclusion before everything adds into place, like chances and opportunities? And Z is the impact. We don't have to contemplate about Z because it hasn't happened yet. Undecided, but soon to be determined. I see you. I see you for more than the black sheep of your family more than the scapegoat who's been wrongfully conceived. When will you see without all the questioning? I see you dancing your favorite black skirt, sometimes in the day, but often at night. I see you gliding in the middle of your living room, grooving like no one's looking at the ocean depths, full of wonderful mysteries of new life waiting to be resurfaced. Thank you. So uh, thank you so much, Ale. Uh, we're welcoming to the stage Caleb, and after Caleb will be Shi Yu. Hello, my name's Caleb. Uh, I'm gonna read a poem today called Unless I Am Dancing, and it's actually a poem that um, started off as an assignment in Professor um, Treya's class, and the assignment was to Write something from the where you <laughs> write something from the per, the perspective as if you were someone else. And I uh, started writing it when I um, had first um, started um, to take dance lessons and joined a studio um, here in town. Something I'd never done before. And I'm happy to say now that uh, this poem actually feels kind of more like myself than <laughs> than someone else. So um, that's kind of cool. So I'll start now. This is called "Unless I Am Dancing." Right, left, right, left, right, left. Point. Always point, melt, melt, melt into my shoes, live step to step, beat to beat, until I'm goop. The music stops. The show doesn't end. Audiences appear in the street, my house, the store. Even once I'm stripped of my rhinestones and concealer, 
It's the turning. I often stand beneath the Norway maples before catching the A back uptown from the studio and imagine my breath is rustling the branches of autumn leaves. Golden torpedoes pass pirouetting blades while five fin planes meander to the pavement. Some are blessed with rot or diseased holes or an asymmetric curl that sends them tumbling down an untraceable path. These leaves are everything. They fall, they fall. I watch, I watch, I am full. With every step, I grind their corpses against the sidewalk before crunching them under my sneakers to a tempo driven by my eagerness to return home. Maybe this is where the guiro came from and dance as a walk in the park. And what will I do when the sun abandons me tonight and tomorrow? Outside the music, time is my ex-partner. I can't find the one. Thank you. That was pretty cool. Um, very excited. It's so cool to see students kind of uh, read their poems after them coming in, into our classes. So, um, but let's welcome to the stage uh, Xing Yu. Hi, everybody. I'm Xing Yu Zhou. Today I'm be presenting a poem called Loneliness. Loneliness. I spilled a cup of coffee on the floor. The whole day I spent outdoor. When I am back, the cup still lies in place. How lucky it is. No need to search for meaning trace. No genies or fairies nor Santa Claus showed and cleaned it up. It just lays and upside down cup. Coffee seems gone since my carpet is black. On a snowy surface, the mass would come to light. So I leave it there. No need for coffee now. For no one is here with me. No laughter to eat now. Tomorrow I might pick it up and add another cup. Or it might stay on the floor for another month if I forget it if I am forgotten. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, awesome, awesome. So we'll have uh, Bridget come read next, and then it'll be followed by uh, Miguel. So please welcome to the stage, Bridget. Hello. Um, my name is Bridget. <laughs> And I also wanted to say that I, one of the poems that I wrote was for Emma's class as well. And 
I want to say that I really appreciate everything that you taught me because I feel like I wouldn't be here without you. So this is my first poem and it's called My Fun Friend. His face, the inquisitive tilt of his head, the arching of his brows, the slow and steady blink. Deep in thought within his own world, he wanders and wonders within a world I am not able to understand. Think of the never-ending distance, he tells me. Pressure and exhaustion become his world. He's left wondering what he's going to do next. And he asks himself if his bed will remain warm at night. Deep in thought, he does not even notice the changes. The silence became more than comfortable. Numbers and letters are the only thing that can occupy his busy mind. All in the name of intellectual pursuit, but it's only just a dream. Thank you. <laughs> How special. Um, so we're welcoming to the stage Miguel, uh, who was a student here at SBCC and uh, works in the International Studies Office. Um, and after Miguel, uh, Monet will be reading. So please welcome to the stage, Miguel. Hey everybody, how's it going? Uh, my name is Miguel and I was a student here and I think I'm the only staff reading, right? Is that you? But I'm, st I'm still cool, right? <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, but honestly, I just want to thank everyone who's read so far. Um, poetry is really sacred to me. I think words are sacred, and thank you for sharing parts of your soul in front of everyone. And I really got a lot out of it. So can we give one more round of applause to everyone that read? So I just came up with an, uh, I just came out with a new booklet, a uh, little chat book. It's called Suicide Notes and Love Letters to a Dying World. Um, it's about my experience through COVID and what I journaled and wrote through COVID. And as you can imagine, it was very dark. I had a really bad mental health struggle during COVID and writing it helped me kick, stay sane. I'll be writing a piece. Um, I used to work at the jail and I used to run writing circles with the men and women in the jails. And we would listen to a song and then write for 15 minutes. So this song was inspired from one of those writing circles uh, inside the jail. And it's titled El Barrio en el Cielo. So the neighborhood in the sky. If you're listening to this poem, that means that God has called me home. But don't worry, because I'm free. No more living with this heart of stone. That means no more tears, no more pain, and no more anything. I'm free from this prison, and at last, I'm one with everything. Tell my family that I love them, especially my baby boy and girl. Tell them I'm going to keep protecting them, though I'm no longer in this world. Because right now, I finally realize that I never hated life, not even when I was at my lowest, and I tried committing suicide. I remember picking up that knife, but all I saw was my daughter's eyes. Her love warmed me even on my coldest night. It wasn't hate that saved me. It was the innocence of a child's love. My time on earth is done. It's time to meet the creator up above. He welcomed me with open arms, and I never felt so mellow. He took me to where I'll be staying, called El Barrio en el Cielo. In the side of this hood, I'm staying on the biggest block I'd ever seen. There's art on all the walls of colors that I'd only seen in dreams. I recognize the people there. They're all from a hood who passed away. Drowsy and wacko made me there. They were laughing, smoking a J. All the homeless people from my streets were there, but they were dressed nice. No more track marks, pain faces, or stressed eyes. I'm reunited with my abuelitos, and I'm living at their pad. They said, how much they miss us, but this is the best home they ever had. I held them tight with all my might and asked them if I made them proud. They said I did, and they were happy that I finally turned my life around. After chopping it up for a while, I tripped out on who I found. All my tios and primos who left before me, they were there holding it down. Although their deaths were tragic, their souls were free from all the pain. I tripped out because I looked around and I realized that I felt the same. When night time came around, I took a stroll through the hood. I saw former enemies cruising, but it was now all good. They invited me to a party to say the hell one every night. When I got there, I was tripping. I thought I was going blind. Selena took the stage with Richie Valens by her side. Later, there was a cypher held by danger from Brown's side. Little youngsters ripping brown pride, and it made me feel good that we finally had a spot to kick it where we're all understood. Later on that night, I met up with Cesar Chavez and Zapata, talking about que viva la revolucion y que viva la raza. Frida and Diego were showing youngsters how to paint murals instead of placas, and for the first time in my life, I ain't worried about nada. Les quiero decir a mis seres queridos que por favor no lloren y por favor no tengan miedo. Por fin, mi alma está libre y aquí los espero adentro del barrio en el cielo. Thank you.
Uh, that was pretty awesome. Um, I was going to say, let's give it up for staff. Woo! <laughs> and let's give it up for Monet. Uh, Hi, um, I'm hiding behind the shades today. Hope that's okay. <clears throat> this piece is called Getting Over Myself. <clears throat> Get over yourself. My labias were too long. Get over yourself. My areolas were too brown. Get over yourself. My ass was too small. Get over yourself. <laughs> My mouth wasn't good for speaking, analogy, metaphor, allegory, simile, euphemism. Get over yourself. My favorite television shows were boring. Get over yourself. My mind is now an aquifer of all things him. His beliefs, his standards, his expectations, his failures as a man and simultaneously of his successes. Empathy, honesty, compassion, morality, love, all things me. At times when I couldn't be, he was for me. One and identity. Twins, we were, they'd say. I didn't need to get over myself. He needed to get over me. Thank you. All right, next we have um, Karina, and then we'll have um, Vivian Storm. So, and again, I have so much gratitude for these poets. This is kind of like an all-stars Many of them uh, participated in other events that we had, one being a collaboration with the museum on a jazz poetry reading um, there. So please welcome to the stage, uh, Karina. Hello, everyone. My name is Karina. This is for my town, y para la niña que prometió que regresaría a casa. There is a place, a home that belongs only to the depths of my heart. But this place, this town, is unknown to the rest of the world. Corralfaso was home to my mother, to my grandmother, home to me for eight years, until we departed on a bus to chase after dreams. The new land did not welcome me nor my people. Years later, I returned to my sweet town, one where the streets are not paved with gold, but the sun and the stars are closer to us. Surrounded by the people who are dearest to me, they water my roots. I blossom as I contemplate my grandmother's smile. The kids, they run free, and their laughter echoes off street corners. They tell me about their dreams and with a shrug run off into sunsets. The people in town, they ask me to say a word in English. When I do, they smile with a sort of admiration a language mysterious to them, but a culprit to their losses. One that has taken everything from them, their children, their families, and a future that may never come. Yet they are resilient. They build wings out of bricks and fly to the highest peaks of eternity. The obstacles and brokenness, they wear them as necklaces. Their smiles are beautiful and fill the afternoons with the sweet warmth. I look into their eyes and find myself surrounded by a constellation of stars. Mis pies tocan el suelo, pero sé que debo estar soñando. My feet touch the ground, but I know I must be dreaming. As I laugh with purpose, love passionately. Porque río con propósito, amo apasionadamente. Y sobre todo, and above all, corro libre sin miedo a la incertidumbre. I run free, unafraid of the uncertainty, unafraid of who I am to the rest of the world, outside of my home, outside Corral Falso. Thank you. Please uh, 
welcome to the stage the one, the only superstar, uh, Vivian Storm. I don't know about y'all, but I come from black church. And so what we do in black church is um, we give like these uh, very uh, uh, crazy disclaimers about things. Well, you know you're going to be good, okay? So I'm going to give you a disclaimer. Um, but the first thing I want to do, because somebody just yell out, you better sing. Yes. I just need some encouragement. It's not a, it's not a disruption. It's, a, it's encouragement in, in black church. So one more time. So you better sing. You better, sing. You better say that poem. Thank you. I just needed that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and whenever you want to do that, you can do that with me, okay? So don't worry. All right? So I was inspired. I wrote this poem in that little lobby back there because um, I was like, I need to do something that's original. I can't be out here doing everybody else's stuff all the time. Um, as a drag queen, I obviously uh, lip sync. So um, I'm always doing somebody else's stuff. And so uh, this year is my year, okay? So I'm going to do some original stuff. I'm recording an album right now. So <laughs> it's all coming, it's all coming. But this one is called Over. Uh, the nights I spend wishing that you will love me are over. No more holding up or carrying the weight of these boulders. My shoulders could use a break, and my heart won't be a recipient or up for debate. All my life, I had to write the wrongs of your teachings on learning the lies that you spill. Today's a new day. Liberation runs gay through my veins, honey. And I am free from all of the, blu the blueprints of your dreams deferred, creating my own path blazed with unconditional love. Okay. Whew. Got that out. This next one is an NDRE song. Anybody know who NDRE is? Okay. When I, when I meet my husband in the future, okay, I'm going to sing this at this wedding, okay? But I'm going to read a couple, and I'll, you know, do a little line or two, you know, for y'all um, with my, uh, my um, auto-tune voice, okay? <clears throat> she says, I love the fragrance of your voice. You're the color of loyal. My favorite sound is your smile. I'm intoxicated with joyful. I feel you on the bottom of my feet, the very blush in my cheek. I love the taste of the words you can't say. You're the very meaning of peace. I am a 10,000 petal flower unfolding in this moment. I feel so vulnerable and so empowered. It's everything, it's nothing, it's perfect. Then she says, <clears throat> Oh, I am moved by you. Oh, I am moved by you. And she says, you're the eyes of a child. You a horse running wild. You the cracking open of a heart. You make me feel so alive. I am honored to know the twinkle of your star. Oh, I am moved by you oh i am moved by you thank y'all so much all the young people who came up here today thank y'all so much we always talk about perfection, but what the world really needs is reality. And what y'all are doing, the imperfections or the perfections, whatever you call it, we need all of it. We can't just have one side. That's why we're so off balance, okay? Oh, not the new purse. <laughs>
but she's intact, okay? <laughs> Just like you would, okay? If you fall, you're going to still come back. And look, sometimes you get a little money in inside, okay? I love y'all and thank y'all so much for this opportunity. Wow, what an afternoon. Um, again, let's give it up for all the students and for Vivian for reading. <laughs> Woo! All right. Uh, poetry is not a luxury. Poetry is a random afternoon where three friends get together to wander around Havana or a city whose name barely changes. Poetry is a trash fire uh, started by teenagers. Poetry is a text from someone not in your contacts. Poetry is an intimacy that needs no explanation. Po poetry is a painting she can't remember. Poetry is a rock absorbing cicada sounds. Poetry is a light that moves us from darkness into darkness. Poetry is in need of grants. Poetry is in need of revolution. Poetry is in need of poets. The late 20th century poet and filmmaker Chris Marker once said that the in the future, everyone will write poetry. This is a future we draw cl closer to with supercomputers in our pocket and the rise of TikTok and memes, but also because of poets like Carmen. This is the sense, this sense of time, wonder, and of everyone speaks to the work of her, of Carmen Jimenez, uh, author of five collections of, um, or I, I didn't count, I should have counted. I, I wrote five, but this morning, oh my God. All right, numerous collections of poetry, a book of essays on mothering, uh, founder and publisher of Noemi, which has put out the first book of a small, uh, numerous folks, first books. Um, she was publisher and editor for over 20 years, and they put out the first book of basically a small army of poets uh, during her time there, and she's now the executive director of Ray Wolf Press. In her poems, Carmen wields pop culture like mythology. She shares in the dark joke of our existence, uh, but never kind of, um, she wonders at the woundedness that we all share, um, not ever pretending to know the answer. Uh, she trusts us like a disc jockey um, at her audience, and she never gives too much her way. Her poems are both minimal and extra, um, her collection, Milk and Filth, is one that I teach in my creative writing classes and is kind of like a punk zine of a gender studies course. And her later work, uh, Be Recorder, bears witness to the intense hour of empire that we find ourselves in, documenting the fragmented relationships and dark dreams of our present. Please welcome to the stage the one and only Carmen Jimenez. <laughs> Thank you. Gosh, I, I feel like I should just, that was hard. This is going to be hard to follow, but I'm going to do my best. Um, I am working on a new book of poems, and so I'm going to read from that book, uh, and I'm going to start with, um, I'm going to start with a poem about Grey's Anatomy. Um, let me get to that one. It's on my phone. Uh, I loved... I have I stopped finally watching, but I did watch it probably the whole time. Um, so this is called Gossip Without Community. <clears throat> Avert your eyes from the glopping bodies of Seattle Grace, where they diagnose the body and soul of every patient. Dr. Dreamy says, I regret to inform you that your wife has died. But as she gasped her last breath, I had a personal epiphany that I must forgive Dr. What's-Her-Name because I, I could lose her just like you could lose her to a sinking tugboat, a bolt of lightning, sarcoidosis. Yet no one says as they review the blank pages of their patients' pretend charts, Dr. Dreamy is a malignant narcissist. I binge Grey's Anatomy on Hulu while I fold laundry. 
A nurse gets stabbed by an unstable patient who they'll discover isn't schizophrenic, but rather controlled by a rare tapeworm. A top surgeon disregards a girl complaining of stomach pains who ends up spewing blood in an arc. Then the surgeon performs an unheard of procedure in the nick of time. A man shows up with a tree limb in his chest, so I lose interest because I'm sure they already did a branch in the chest episode. They grow a nose on an arm, survive explosion after explosion, do surgery in a hyperbaric chamber. Someone please calculate the cost of remodeling the weird socialist clinic, plus workmen's comp, rampant malpractice and sexual harassment suits, the humanitarian projects, the 3D liver printer, and the salaries for the best of the best surgeons of all space and time. A resident gets hit by a bus. A boy gets impaled by a fence. A plane crash kills a bunch of the doctors, or some of them survive with only the most fleeting traces of PTSD. A train crash, a hostage situation, an escaped prisoner, another hostage situation. Gray's anatomy follows the arc of my fantasy life, so I consume the buttercreamy cud of a show. Have you ever tried eating the seventh seal or the sexual violence of Game of Thrones? Gray's anatomy is like a spouse of a hundred years, the spouse you don't say a word to, but fall asleep with at exactly the same time. Thank you, you don't have to, <laughs> it's a, thank you, thank you. You don't have to clap. So I'm gonna read another one that's about, um, about film, and t I love writing about film and TV. Um, and so one of the, this one was kind of uh, from watching a zombie show and I was like, it would smell really bad in the zombie apocalypse. Like I would be gagging the whole time during the zombie apocalypse, but they don't really show that. So that's how this poem was, was born. I started thinking about other things that I found hard to believe. This is called Suspicion for Suspension of Disbelief. As if he'd be digging a grave without gloves on. As if people wouldn't be gagging from the stench of zombie, de zombie decay, their loosened bowels. As if the heroine's MAC lipstick wouldn't have worn off before the big presentation. As if she could talk to her boss like that and keep her job. As if she wouldn't wobble on her Manolos by day's end. As if evil had such bad aim as if he wasn't a stalker, roses and songs or not, as if people in movies didn't watch movies, lay listless in bed, binge eat or shoplift, not in a pathological way, but in the regular human way, as if we knew what murder sounds like when we assess a film death's accuracy, like you see the fake dead's, dead actor's chest move up and down, how disappointed are you? In this world we play, playing dead, our chest barely rising, imperceptible, our best performance. Carmen. My father pulled a geographical almost every year, a million reinventions, so I waited for the next place in order to erase my first name, which fed, felt like a lead mantle, Carmen, a name stranger than any other I heard in the neighborhoods we lived in, the very edge of decent school districts, duplexes we rented month to month with doors that stuck, cracked foundations and lime-stained tubs. I was the only Carmen for miles, except for my ma friend Mary's uncle, which only made it worse. I hated the name's dense oddness, the only term I can conjure back when exotic was dangerous, repellent, the erm in the middle, the heavy gong of n, the click in k. So the summer before seventh grade, I became Elizabeth, my middle name, clean, invisible. What could be more elegant than Elizabeth? Who could suspect Elizabeth, queen and purple-eyed ingenue? It was an immaculate pretty I hoped to be, my hair made fine and limpid. My family went along with it, perhaps out of pity or because they too knew what it was like to be some brand of illegible and see we all let me move 
in the world like the emperor bared, but too soon Carmen spilled out, unruly curl, and I was the same mess, still Carmen inside my skin, the click of Ka, the man in men. So I, um, <clears throat> I have, speaking of revision, because I think we were talking a little bit about it, I had all of these love poems for my partner, and they were really, really bad. And, <laughs> um, and so I, I was thinking of the poet Sappho, the, um, the, the, I mean, I just think the ancient Greek lesbian, um, whose poems were found, that, not the whole poems, they were just little fragments. And so I just took all of my bad, lesbian love poetry and made it into one long lesbian poem. So you can tell me if I did a good job of like taking all of the good, I just took the good parts out of it and then just left it kind of fragmenty so you can see it it's kind of looks like a Sappho poem. Sapphix. You sink me in orange flowers, hollow cheeked backstory swallows itself and us beguile coarse Naive after I licked Ismus fingers in each mouths I do love with eyes passing discs of light to sequester you, a hotel room queen beds swaddled in a bed's filthy coverlet. The lamp explodes, the dog needs to pee, candles kiss a most democratic touch for years. The writer snaps a kite out, startling sky, a voice taking horizon, making it velvet, a charge rode through air into another country. You are sun wound, the sounds dream up, first fall, days you dove over, floods glass face, leaking river into river, I threw word open keyhole, red, green, flicker, unpredictable animal, you know you want, find me, walking off rough, shout gold, a tunnel bores each hour, motif shimmer of music, open windows, tight cave, a nest of papers, mine is you, teacup, filigreed with cracks, water tinged, your brown skin, golden repair of those cracks, story of my surge. Had we stayed strangers, we might haven't, imminent cloud or portal kissed me, I drink nectar for magic. Elements skim I, face where rebellion of light, we rise from the bed after surge, lucid instances, I knew nothing, care you saw feral and base, cracked peeling wings, I miss disappearing practice, heartbreak with a statue, press skin to marble, time perpendicular, wind whistles, you cradle me quickened flower of aging body, like banishing graveyard, death's breath on me, throw your mouth open, sailor in my seas, dream like the dead, even coo, a coil of hair into mine, what risk, stranger, wavelengths, pulse, heartbeat, you were, you, late, one night, against a fire, would have happened, almost happened, does, gold of North Dakota, scenic, as clavicles swoop, a gust of desire untwined. You know, thank you, thank you. I'm not pausing because I want your applause, but I don't mind it. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm sorry, I'm not doing a good job of keeping track, but I'm also, I'm gonna turn it around and um, like talk about exes. And I'm sure we've all had that phone call with our ex in which they say their things, they say their piece, and you have to, deal with it. So this is about that. This is called the X's Tirade. I'll take the kernel of truth in the harangue on the other side of the phone line. Even in its cruelty, I hold on to its familiar sting and take the truth about my human performance. I'll quaff the bile thirstily as I was taught. This yummy bile tastes like freedom. 
I gulp it, the lesson in the unloading, then write it as revenge into my reinvention. Um, I am going to, so I, being by an ocean um, makes me think I grew up um, around, I'm, I'm from California uh, and I love oceans, but uh, I had a, a traumatic, weird experience that actually made me very afraid of oceans. And this is about that. It's called thalassophobia, which is a phobia for oceans. Thalassophobia. A lasso of clouds lashes the sun to the horizon dotted with fishing boats, each swimmer a flicker in the cold blue. My legs are furred with girlhood, my body sanded and gritty under my red, white, and blue suit. I can't keep my food down, don't know what I am. My brother and I float out into the water on an inner tube and the ocean carries us past the waves and the swimmers, past the sight of our parents, though it's really me kicking us farther into the ocean's murk. I don't often touch this story bound up in the peril I chased all of my life, close calls, near deaths, slim odds. When a man swims to us out in the deep, my brother bristles and the man does what predators do, oily, false flattery, tentative touch. Struck dumb, we stare desperately at the beach where my father haggles for a basket. This man sees how far we are from the orbit of our father who was a tornado who cast us against walls. We had such diligent lessons on the tenor of obedience. We barely move as he slithers in the nowhere of the ocean. Then he hesitates, negotiating moral quandary. My brother now says, this is when he feels me tremble as we both frantically kick back to shore, even a riptide safer than a man. The waves had no scruple, only cold overturning, and we washed up clutching the tube, our family none the wiser, their dramas far outside this rupture from innocence I drove us into. I'm writing this series of poems about um, art that I love, but I, that I don't remember the exact details of it. I mostly remember um, um, watch, like seeing it or encountering it. And this is a memory um, of watching a movie with someone who didn't like me anymore. It's called an art film I can't remember. The lover had bought a TV for us even though the lover professed a hatred of such bourgeois trappings. So we could watch the black and white movies that foregrounded the effortless arty they possessed. But all I have left in my mind is a 60s siren in a black turtleneck. I was eager to be civilized. This movie meant as a lesson. So there's the lover and me and the screen and the iceberg of contempt planted between us. I remember it was April and the lover was in love with someone else, which I discovered reading their journal left carelessly in their drawer. And the lover won't even explain the symbolism, perhaps resigned, mostly bored, waiting for me to leave so they could then A, break up with me over the phone and then B, give the TV to a neighbor, which they did the following week, citing my instability. And giving the TV away hurt more than ending the whole sad sequence of months we strung together. The movie featured inseparable lovers in sharp contrast. Everyone smoked aggressively, and love was a man gripping a woman's shoulders filled with avant-garde mad love, which means intense and world-changing rebuke in his lips, burning against her, an actor and actress giving in to the inevitable end of even an art movie, she said nothing. The kiss, it changed me. I'd always be at the edge of this. In the air, a nuclear end to my refinement. Screaming. So my mom is in a nursing home in, um, in Peru. Uh, and I got a, a message from my aunt. Um, she has Alzheimer's that she had started screaming. And she wouldn't stop screaming. And she sent me a video of my mom screaming. Screaming. In Lima, my mother screams from her bed and from a garden and in the parlor of her nursing home. 
and she screams as they wheel her down the street and when they change her diaper. And my aunt texts me to tell me about her screaming, and I'm left to imagine what's at the core of her new tongue, a smattering of grunts and cries. And in the last video, she screams, mis hijos, mis hijos, which I cling to because it means we still exist in her. And she screams in horror, like waking up in a dungeon, the yowl at the end of death. She is the loud wail of all human suffering, telling of our basest truth, the barbaric yop, but divine as great whale song. Yet she calls from miles away, and I want to answer her call. So I scream back into the chirp of cicadas, the rustle of trees, past the rush of highway towards the clouds where planes zoom southward over the thin air and Andean peaks, the scream vibrating outwards, send it to the touch at the edge of her scream so she feels me, hija, inside her scream's shudder. Um, this one's called Ambition. I burned through scraps for what I was sure lived on the other end of my striving, each minute in a waiting room, each overtime hour trudged through, each ass kissed, each smile faked, the layovers, the failures I treated as speed bumps. I thought I could turn humiliation into gold, and I did in a way, though I'm still left spinning in the corner like Rumpelstiltskin, who still can't guess the exact name I've earned. Ode to people who hate me. I hate being hated, even though I promote, provoke it, not by committing major wrongs like murder, more like a pattern of being selfish or forgetful, which is another word for selfish. If you hate me, trust me, I know. In fact, I have a ledger of people like you who hate me, and I rifle through it every morning, obsessing over their names more than they think about mine, a passing thought, a microsecond of dislike, or worse, indifference, like the Godzilla rays of fire I feel buzz out of your eyes when you scroll past my pictures on Instagram. I should focus on the people who love me, every therapist I ever had has told me so, but I don't need them to love me more, so that's pointless. If we hate each other, I assure you my hate has a trace of love with a dash of hope. It's the throbbing contradiction of hate's dark thrall. A painting I can't remember, six. Dry is really what finished means, so painters ask people around them, please be careful when you bring me tea. Don't brush against the easel. The paint is still wet. Then paint isn't wet anymore. Then the painting is art. A painter catches that succulence and thinks, I've done a perfect thing, nearly alive. Paintings hold your face in their hands and suck you directly into their eyes. What I once heard a famous actor did as seduction. I wish I was brave enough to seduce that way. Mostly, I fall deeper into paintings, that former wet, because the artist's touch lives there. They circled the wet canvas, hands brushing against the canvas, undoing vexation and stain the succulence exhales. When people who don't make art, civilians you might say, when they see a painting and say they could do what the artist did, I think, well try flying by jumping off a building and flapping your arms. I'm gonna read one more new one and then a couple from Milk and Filth, which I know that Josh teaches from, which I'm very grateful about. Um, it's been nice to revisit the book. Some, when Sometimes when you write poetry, you just kind of are, books get into your rear view, but it was nice to look back and see what I was doing back in the day. This one's called It Was the Waiting. I'll tell you how this poem actually got made because it's a fun exercise if you're poets. Um, I have this exercise that I do that I take a poem that already exists 
and I drop it into this uh, interface online that reverses all of the words. So the last word is the first word, the penultimate word is the second word. And I then I just, it's totally crazy raw material and I make it into a new poem. And this is, I used a Ross Gay poem to do this one. It's called, It Was the Waiting. It is spring and I'm green young and terrible at basketball. The neighbor and I sought out the profanity of sugar walls on the radio, and my name felt like a maze. I was passing notes and sneaking listens to purple rain, the skeleton in the mirror all night long measuring my bones against all the other skeletons in school. I bought persimmons because I liked the name, stole the Snickers I liked to melt then eat, and skinned my knees falling off a skateboard. Some skeletons were generous and left me to my planet, my head grizzled like a vulture nodding at roadkill. The eerie sound of prints backwards droning, hello, how are you? Something was coming, something soon. I don't know if you all knew that you could play it backwards, but it was scared the heck out of me the first time I did it, but then I was fascinated by it. If you, do, if you haven't done it, I guess you can't play the record backwards if you don't have a record, but I'm sure you can find it online. Let's play Dar Darling Nikki backwards. Okay, just a few from, um, just a few from um, Milk and Filth. I'm gonna actually start with the last one because I'm kind of fond of it. It's called When God Was a Woman. When God was a woman, empire was meh. When God was a woman, we built schools of listening, and every week we sat quietly until we could hear each other's thoughts. No shadows when God was a woman. Little girls had great dominion and grandmothers were venerated. Sky was the giant bellows of her inside. The grace of God meant flowing and willowy. This was when God was a woman. She played harmless pranks because she liked keeping things light. She made it rain on our collective good hair days. When she met someone who seemed fun and a little mysterious, she invited him into heaven. Then she made her daughter blind for a week, which in retrospect was kind of mean, but her daughter made the best of it. The daughter, this is about my daughter, who was very little when I wrote this, but now she's 17. We said she was a negative image of me because of her lightness. They call her White Carmen. She's light and also passage, the glory in my cortex. Daughter, where did you get all that goddess? Her eyes are Neruda's two dark pools at twilight. Sometimes she's a stranger in my home because I hadn't imagined her. Who will her daughter be? She and I are the gradual ebb of my mother's darkness. I unfurl the ribbon of her life, and it's a smooth, long hallway, doors flung open. Her surface is a deflection is why. Harm on her, harm on us all. Inside her, my grit and timber, my reckless. Um, when I was young, I was a huge fan of Joan Rivers, who was a, a comedian. I, you might not know who she was. And she wasn't, I don't think she ended up being a funny person when, when she was older. But when I saw her, she was the first campy female comedian. I saw her, I remember, on Jan Johnny Carson. And so all of these are lines that are based on jokes of Joan Rivers. It's called, Can We Talk Here?, which was kind of her tagline. Can we talk here after Joan Rivers? My soul's myelin sheath is so tattered, even the tattoo of drumming fingernails makes me a fundamentalist. I have no sugar left after 40. If my husband wasn't twisted and starved, we might never turn our sex into text. My parents can't describe me. All they ever see is assimilation and coconut. All they say is, why can't you just build yourself a Trojan horse into the big league? My first marriage killed itself, but it was my fault. 
We were playing house, and then I took the bag off my face, revealing Mina Loy in housewife drag. Before I write poems, the laptop takes a painkiller. Poetry has more holes than Swiss, holy and pale yellow and sliced in markets. Our system is so broken, I break for commercials before the Q&A. I blame white privilege for my poor sense of self. All they tell me is this small cell will be your pasture. For 20 years, I built a key from the shrapnel in my head. I write flabby poems, but fortunately, my smart bombs cover them. I knew I was an unwanted visitor to the paradigm parade when I saw that my gift basket included nuance and a muzzle. I told poet X that this house was our house, and he said, the boat awaits your olive complexion, but that's just white persona talking. I wish I was a clone so I could know what I'd look like without the imbroglio. Is poetry fat? Let's just say that second helpings of unpolitic irony is a buffet. My body is so distended from being vessel and highway, I barely notice the husband's invasion until the leak and the hiss. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming and for being part of this. Uh, uh, very special afternoon. Uh, I just wanted to share that we'll have two more creative writing events uh, before the semester is out. On uh, next Tuesday, May 2nd, uh, Roberto Tejada, who's also a visiting artist at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art, will be giving a workshop at the Atkinson Gallery on how to write about art. Um, then Matthew Stadler will be zooming in with us during finals week to talk about uh, publishing, editing, and writing novels. Thank you so much for coming and being part of this, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.